Hello, welcome to another episode of the Leading Yourself podcast. This week, we continue with the series of personal productivity and time management, and I'm so excited to have a very special guest today, Megan Sumro, who is a productivity and time management coach. She was a corporate techie that retired, and now he's an entrepreneurial that works in this space. As a business owner, as a mom, as a wife, she knows exactly how hard it is to deal with all the things and still maintaining a sense of self and purpose. And now she's helping women all around the world claiming their productivity and their time management. Welcome, Megan, to the Leading Thank Yourself you. podcast. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. I'm so excited for you to be here. Um, I was watching a video on a training that you did. And as I watched, I was watching it. I'm like, I have to invite Megan to the podcast because people need to hear what she has to say and all these amazing tips that you have around personal productivity um, and reclaiming your calendar and your time without sacrificing your priorities and your personal life. Yeah. So let's kick things off with maybe talk a little bit about yourself and what you do and how is that you ended up where you are today? Yeah, because no one wakes up and says, you know what, I'm going to help people with time management, right? <laughs> or right. maybe they do. I don't know. That was not me. Uh, so I actually have a background. I spent over 20 years in the software IT space um, where, uh, you know, my, my path in that kind of morphed into, I spent the last decade or so really focused on helping software companies implement the right quality systems and processes so that they could build their software plat platforms better, faster, cheaper. So I've always been drawn to systems and processes and understanding just how much of a time saver, cost saver that it really can be when you implement that. Um, and over the course of my career, I, I took all the old school traditional time management courses that I think so many people are probably familiar with the Franklin Coveys. I did some stuff with Michael Hyatt. Um, and I really, I had gotten really good at managing my workload, my productivity, my time inside of my corporate job. And I got married later in life, started a family later in life and, I stupidly can remember those days before becoming a mom where I'd be in the line at the grocery store target and I'd see a mom that just looked kind of frazzled and her kids were there and they all looked just exhausted. I remember thinking, oh, that'll never be me. <laughs> Boy, was I wrong. <laughs> so um, after my daughter was born, I, I completely, like my life felt like it derailed. And because I am someone that is very passionate about getting, getting my job done and all of that, I was getting it all done, but I was doing it at the cost of myself. And I wasn't even aware that it was happening until one day when my daughter was about three, um, I had started work early that day to get off early to go have some time at the park with her. And I was pushing her on a swing and a woman next to me, another mom looked over and said, you know, started a conversation. And at one point she said, so what do you do for fun? And I sat there and I realized I had no answer. Like I couldn't even remember the last time I had done anything for myself or anything outside of work and family. And that was when it, I mean, it hit me like a ton of bricks. And that night I went home and I remember lying in bed and crying because I felt guilty. Cause I'm like, okay, here I am. I finally have all these things that I wished for and yearned for, and I'm really unhappy. And so that's when I knew I'm like, I've got to, I've got to figure this out. I can't continue to live my life this way. So that's when I threw everything aside that I'd been taught about how to manage our time, how to control our calendars and schedules. And I had that aha moment where I realized everything that I'd been taught was being taught by men in a corporate setting. And it wasn't addressing so much that women have on our plates, particularly when we're also caregivers or moms or whatever. So that was kind of what launched me into figuring out why do these systems and processes not work for me anymore? And what can I put in place instead? And so I made changes in my life. People noticed 
amazing results there. I started speaking at some local um, networking and women's group in the in my area. And then it kind of catapulted into me creating this entire program. And so several years ago, I completely left my corporate um, job behind and I am now full-time in this passion of helping other women get unstuck like I was. That is so amazing. And, and that's so true. Like many times we think that if we just work harder, if we just do more, like everything is going to be fine and, and we yeah. can do whatever we want to do. And, and the reality is that at the end of the day, the day only has 24 hours. Exactly. And I always say it only has 24 hours for everyone, right? Everyone has the same 24 hours. The, the key is how you use those 24 hours and how how are you aligning your time really with your priorities? Because a lot yep. of times our priorities take the back seat, the back burner, because they're not urgent a lot of times. They're, they're important, but they're not urgent. Um, and I know I'm getting into Franklin Covey right now. And, and, and <laughs> I know exactly I was, where you're the grid that you're referring to because right? I use it all the time. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, but talking about the system that you have created, uh, one thing that really interested me when I was listening to you talking the other day was you have developed this pyramid of productivity. And it was, it really clicked with me because a lot of times I think that we're in go, go mode, especially women that we're always multitasking. We're always trying to keep all these balls in the air. And because we're busy, we think that we're being productive and we're getting things done and we are super women. Yep. But yet when I was listening to you and, and thinking through, I'm like, oh, maybe I'm not at the top of that pyramid. Can you talk a little bit about this pyramid and, and how this sure. concept works? Yeah. And one of the phrases I'm sure you remember me saying a lot, I say it all the time is busy is not productive, right? Because you could be busy all day long and at the end of the day, not have done any of those important things. So my, the productivity pyramid that I've created, um, there's basically three sides that you need to put in place in order to really learn how to control your calendar again, so that you can actually have work-life harmony. And so the three sides of the pyramid, the first one is learning the right way to handle your task list. So I have an acronym around that that I call coping with your task list, um, where I teach people how to get that list of all the things, the things you want to do, the things you have to do, all of it in a way that actually works for you. Then the second side of the pyramid is your actual calendar itself. Um, people don't realize the power of getting the right calendar system, just how much it can actually help you. And then the third part is where at first people get uncomfortable, but the third part is structure. And when you learn how to put the right structure in place with your task list and your calendar, that's when you start to actually have that freedom of time again. So the journey that people typically go on as they work their way to the top of that pyramid um, first is, and most people, when they find me, they're in a state of what's called reaction where, and that's where I lived for years, where you are literally handling what's in front of you right at that given moment, right? So you may sit down to do something, but then the phone rings, so you stop and you answer that. Then a text goes off, so you respond to that. Then your email dings, so now you go into there. Then your child comes in and now you're handling that. And you just go through your entire day reacting to what's in front of you. And it is an exhausting way to live. And it means that you're typically context switching every five to 10 minutes sometimes. Um, mostly when you're there, that's when you're just so busy being busy, you don't even know. The next stage up from that being in reaction mode is your realization. And for me, it was that day at the park when that woman said, what do you do for fun? And I sat there and went, crap, literally I have nothing. That was my realization that this is not going to serve me. This is not sustainable. Something's got to change. Um, so then the next step up is refactoring. And this is where we actually learn different ways of how we're going to manage our time and actually put it into practice. And then at the very top, that's when we then can hit results. 
And, you know, different stages of life, you may be moving up and down that pyramid. Um, but once you learn the right systems and tools, I tend to kind of go back and forth between results and refactoring. So, you know, when, when the pandemic hit and everything changed, I had to go change some, some things with my calendar. So I went back to refactoring again until I felt like I was achieving results. But once you have those tools in your, in your toolbox, you can respond to those changes so much easier and get back on top of your productivity game again. So if someone is in this reaction stage, right, where a lot of times you don't know what you don't know, you're busy and you're confusing busy with productive. A lot of times you, at the end of the day, you're like, oh, it was a great day. I, I accomplished a lot of things. But when you step back and really ask yourself, what did I really accomplish? Maybe you realize that you didn't accomplish much. You were just running from one task to the next and you know, a lot of us, especially in a corporate setting, when you ask someone, how are you doing? The most often answer to that question is, oh, I'm busy. Mm -hmm. And we say it with pride. Like it, it's something. The busy badge of honor. Right. Yep. The, the busy badge of honor. So when people are in this stage of reaction, how can you create awareness about the fact that you are here and something needs to change. Um, in your case was, you know, that other mom asking you, what do you do for fun? But if you're not prompted by someone else, how can you create self-awareness to realize that something needs to change? One of the things I always will ask people right out of the gate is, and I'll say, be honest, like this is a safe space. Do you most, most days, do you feel satisfied and joy filled? And when you, you know, most people, will be, oh, of course, of course, I'm happy. I have a great life. I'm like, I didn't ask if you had a great life. I didn't ask if you were happy. I asked, do you feel fulfilled? And do you truly have joy on the inside? I had a very fulfilling life. But when I was finally honest with myself, I wasn't super joy filled, right? I had happy days and things that were fun and all of that. Um, an exercise that I have everybody go through right at the very beginning, um, when they go through my program is to can, and it will, this will help uncover this for people is to go through a time audit. And so for a week, I have everybody would have a worksheet they fill out and it's basically every 15 to 30 minutes throughout the day, they're writing down what they did you know, and maybe it's, I was working on this project. Maybe it's, I'm cleaning. Maybe it's, I was cooking dinner or taking kids to school. Um, and if all of a sudden you look at your clock and like two hours have gone by and it's one of those things where you're like, I don't, I don't know what I was just doing for the last two hours, but I was busy. I just have them put a big question mark in there to kind of signify I was kind of all over the place. And I'm not really sure what specifically I was doing. Um, once we go through that, then I go through a color coding technique where we identify what are all the roles you play? So maybe you're an employee, maybe you're a bit, you know, maybe you own a business like me, maybe you own multiple businesses. Um, maybe you're a caregiver, a spouse, a mom, whatever. And we highlight each one, like throughout that time audit, we go back and highlight based on what role were you in at that given time. And for most of the women, just that exercise alone is so eye-opening because they'll look back at the week and they'll see that color changing nonstop. And that brings such awareness of, oh my God, like I am on all cylinders all day long and recognizing that they feel almost like that, that ball inside a pinball machine where they're just going back and forth all day long. And to just visually be able to see that is like that first step of awareness of, okay, now let's look at how we can restructure some things so that now we have fewer colors on our calendar each day and they're in big blocks of time instead of switching every 15 or 30 minutes. Yeah, I think that's so powerful because I think, you know, me personally, a few years ago, I took pride of the fact that I was able to multitask. Mm -hmm. And I would talk to people like, yeah, I'm in multitasking mode all day and I'm so productive. And that's the only way that I can get all the things done. And 
time has gone by and I realized that the more that you multitask, the less productive that you are, the more busy you are most of the times, but the less productive that you are at the end of the day and the less fulfillment that you get from what you're doing. Because a lot of times you're doing things almost in autopilot. Um, I was curious when you said you asked people to put a question mark, how often do you see question marks all all over the place? Oh, I mean, everybody's got chunks of times, particularly if you're a mom, you're going to have, and like for me, my, what was my question mark was always that window of after school up to the dinner hour. Well, now I just know I don't, that is what I call my unavailable time. I recognize it's different every day. I might need help with homework. I might not, I need to be available, but I can't be in task mode, but I know that. So I work around it, but it's interesting when you talk about multitasking, I am multitasking is fantastic when it's done the right way. And what I think most people confuse is the difference of multitasking versus what I call context switching. Context switching is the killer of productivity. Multitasking done right can really help you. So that subtle difference of Context switching is when you're trying to wear more than one hat at the same time or switching them like rapid fire. So you're cooking dinner while you're trying to answer a text while you're helping your kid with homework. That's context switching. You're trying to have three hats on all at the same time, right? Whereas really powerful multitasking, I love to consume podcasts, audible books, all of that for you know personal development. I do that when I'm folding laundry because my brain isn't trying to engage in two places at once. You know, I can, I can fold the clothes while I'm actually listening to the podcast. And I'm, that is a, is a highly effective way of multitasking. So I always tell people, just make sure that your brain is only needing to be engaged in one of those activities at a time. I always say the same thing. I'm like, there are things that are habits that are so ingrained on us that they require no brain power. Like I can be, you know, folding laundry, like, you know, um, putting, preparing coffee in the morning. Like I do that and I don't even realize that I'm doing it because it's so ingrained that those are things that don't require any brain power. And that's where I find I can multitask. Like I can be, you know, as you said, folding laundry or, preparing the coffee in the morning and I'm listening to a podcast or I'm, you know, on a phone call because I don't need to think. Exactly. It kind of happens in autopilot, right? Yeah. Um, But I agree with you a lot of times, especially now over the pandemic, we, everyone has experienced this wearing multiple hats at the same time and being put in this situation where, you know, most people are working from home, their kids are home, So they have to try to figure out how to be productive at work while not being in the office, while homeschooling their kids, we're taking care of the house. And I think that that is is why people are experiencing such a big burnout at this point because of all this context switching, as you call it. I love that term. It's, okay, so how to get past that that point, what are some initial steps that can help someone start to get control of their time and and align that with their priorities and feeling that joy and and fulfillment that you're talking about? Yeah. And it's, you know, it's a process, right? We don't learn how to ride a bike the first time we go out. And so I always, you know, tell people, Hey, if you're serious about this and you really want to learn all these systems and tools, give yourself grace that we're going to do it step-by-step and it is going to be a process. Um, but most of the women that I work with, there are so many revelations along the way that they really start to feel it from the inside out. Um, but where I, w- I always tell people, if you're coming, if you're in a place right now where you're just almost in that paralyzed from overwhelm, you're just like, I don't even know where, I don't even know where to start. It's, it's daunting. I I tell everybody the quickest way to get out of overwhelm is, and you got to do pen to paper. We're not going to do this electronically. We're going to get pen to paper or post-it notes. I really love to use post-it notes and take 10, 15 minutes and brain dump 
everything that is churning in your head that you're thinking about that needs to get done, whether it's work, business, personal, home life, whatever it is, get it all out. Because most of us, whether we realize it or not, we're relying on our brain to remember everything. And that alone is taxing our energy um, by asking our brain to do that. So we've got to get it out on paper where we can actually see it. So I just rapid fire whenever I, and you're like, I always have to do this. Like when I come back from a vacation, right? Where we always come in, we're like, oh my God, I just went on vacation. Now my world's <laughs> falling apart. So I do this rapid fire list of what's everything I need to think of, you know, I'm writing down work stuff. And then I'm also including, oh, and I, we need to go to the grocery store because there's no food in the house. And then I need to do the laundry and I need to get my email campaigns done. And you're just getting it all out. Then take a quick pass through that list and ask yourself, is there anything on here that I can knock out in two minutes or less? Literally would take me two minutes or less and circle those. And then before doing anything else, go do them. Nine times out of 10, there's rarely any more than maybe five to eight things that you could honestly do in two minutes or less. So if you just go into action for like 20 minutes, you will already starting to build that momentum of getting back on top of things again. Because now look, you've checked eight things off on your list. Then we come back and revisit it. And then I'll ask myself, okay, what has to, not want to, but has to, be done in the next 48 hours, just 48 hours. And I'll identify those items. Then I'll go actually to my calendar and I will write, create appointments on it for when I'm doing those specific things. And at this point, I'm just gonna leave the rest of that list alone and just focus on getting kind of back in motion for the next 48 hours. Then at the end of that window, now you can go back and revisit your list and say, okay, now what do I need to look at for the next week? And this is, I call this kind of my getting out of overwhelm process. This isn't how I plan every day or week, but it's what I do to help get started or to get unstuck when I feel like I'm just all over the place again. Because you, you get those quick wins by getting those two minute things done then you rest the stress from your brain because you're identifying only the things that truly have to for the next 48 hours. And now when you come to look back at the rest of your list, you're coming to it from a place with so much less stress. I love it. Um, I always keep a notebook next to my bed because at night, you know, a lot of times your brain cannot stop thinking of all the things that you need to do. Mm -hmm. And I love to do this brain dumps at the end of the day, really putting it in paper and writing them down. And I find that handwriting it makes a world of a difference. It's not the same if I'm typing it on my no. phone that if I'm writing it down because it creates that connection with the brain where you really feel that you're letting go of those things and you can keep going with what you're doing and you can always come back and you know you're not going to forget about them. Yep. You know, yep. one thing that, I love it because I, I have a very similar approach, but on my day to day, and I'm interested to get your thoughts on this, but one of the things that I always share is part of my planning process on every day. One of the first thing, the first thing that I do before I check my email, when I get to work is I write down on a post-it note, my three priorities for the day. The three things that for me are non-negotiable. So no matter what, before the day ends, I'm gonna do these three things. Um, and of course I try for them to be aligned with my top priorities at that time, my key projects. These are not, sometimes are easy tasks, but sometimes mm -hmm. it's a component of something that is bigger, right? Um, I always ask myself, what can I do today that will move the needle on those things that are most important? And then I block the first hour of my day so I don't get any meetings to get at least one of those things done. Because I so much agree with you that if you start your day, like getting something done from your list it creates such a momentum and energy. And then you feel on the top of the world that, okay, today it's going to be a productive day. Because yeah. I feel in the past, um, I, I can be in meetings from the minute the day starts to the end of the day. 
And those days that I'm back to back in meetings are the days that I go to bed asking myself, what did I do today? I did not accomplish anything. Like I, I jumped from meeting to meeting, but I didn't get anything done. And I feel so frustrated at the end of the day. So for me, if, if I, before I even open my email, I, I have my Outlook, I use Outlook as my main tool. I have it set up so it defaults to my calendar and not my email. That way I don't get distracted with my email, but I look at my calendar and I start my day setting my priorities and planning my day, like asking myself, do I need to be in this meeting or that meeting? I was sharing on the previous podcast episode that a lot of times You go to a meeting and halfway through the meeting, you realize that you shouldn't be there. Right. That you're not adding value to the conversation and the conversation is not adding value to you. And many times you can add much more value to the topic by making sure that the right person is in the conversation and that person not always is gonna be yourself. So Mm -hmm. I always do an audit on my day first thing in the morning, do I need to be in all these meetings? Well, what should one I of the ask things someone, that, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, should I ask someone else to take my place so I can use that time to do something that is really going to add value to my organization, to my projects, to my priorities? Um, and that is that has been such an aha moment for me because I was living in this world of meeting after meeting, mm-hmm going to bed, feeling that I didn't accomplish anything and starting all over the next day. Yeah. When it, when it comes to meetings, um, when I was still in corporate, one of the rules that I instituted with every team that I worked with was if you are scheduling a meeting, you are not allowed to schedule it without outlining the clear agenda of the meeting and the outcome that you're hoping to get. You are not allowed to schedule one without that in the meeting invite. Then on the flip, I would say, if you are invited to a meeting that does not have a clear, here's the agenda and here's what we're trying to achieve from it, don't go. And that was always my number one rule in any organization. And the amount of meeting requests would drop almost in half because you just meet to meet. But when you have to sit and think about clearly, what is the purpose of this? What is the outcome that I hope to get from this meeting? It creates a completely different structure. Now for, you know, on the entrepreneur side, it's different for me, right? But I have, I mean, just this morning, I had two people reach out, hey, I'd love to get on your calendar for 20 minutes. So we have the opportunity to get to know each other. My reply back to both was, what are you hoping to get from this meeting? What are the talking points that we want to cover so that I can then, first of all, I'm making them now rethink, you know, I don't get value out of a random chit chat for 20 minutes from somebody I don't know. But if there's a reason you want to connect with me, what is it? What is the ultimate outcome of this call? And if you can respond back to me, one of them came back with a clear agenda. I said, great. The other one just said, I thought we'd get to know each other. And I said, I'm sorry, I can't right now. My calendar's full. So I tell, like, be so careful when it comes to meetings on, and it's okay to push back and ask somebody, what is the purpose of this? Um, And when you were mentioning, you know, starting your day with planning your day, one of the big shifts that I really encourage people to make and the foundation of everything inside my time management program is learning actually weekly planning instead of daily planning. Uh, And when I, because I used to do the daily planning method But I can't tell you how many times the next day, half my day was taken rewriting the stuff from the day before onto this day that didn't get done and then carried over to the next. And so when, because I wasn't taking a holistic view of my week. So now I have a whole, I have my basic, what I call weekly planning 101, which is a five-step process. And then when you learn, get really good at that, I expand it into a 10-step process. So I spend about 15 minutes every Sunday And I do my complete plan for the next week, which is what allows me to then proactively reserve pockets of time to make sure I don't get overbooked and overscheduled. Yeah, especially if you work in the corporate world. And I mean, I can't speak for the entrepreneurial world because it's it's foreign to me, but (laughs) (laughs) 
I think that if you only relay on daily planning, only on daily planning, it's already too late. Exactly. Like your calendar is already full for that day. Like my calendar is full a month ahead. Like I need to plan, I need to be ahead of my calendar so I can be in control of what gets into my calendar instead of my calendar being in control of my time. Yeah. And I'll always ask people, I'm like, when you wake up in the morning, are you waking up saying, okay, what am I doing today? Or are you waking up saying, here's what I'm doing today? Such a subtle difference, but a complete game changer. If you are waking up going, I wonder, you know, what am I doing today? It's too late. You're already in reaction mode. If you are waking up saying, well, here's my, here's what I, my plan for the day. Now, does that mean it's always going to happen perfectly? Of course not. But you are already stepping into your day with a sense of purpose and attacking it from a, I'm in control, not what's coming at me first that now let me go handle that. And that's why the planning is so important. Yeah, absolutely. So we're talking already about some do's and don'ts, but based on your experience in, in this area, what are the most common mistakes that people make when it comes to managing their time? So I'll share two of them. There's a lot. Um, the first is they don't have one central place that they use that I like to call it my command center that helps them identify what needs to be done and when it needs to happen. Instead, they're like, well, I use my Gmail calendar for this. I use Outlook for this, but then I've got my day planner for that. But then I've got my notebook for meetings and then I've got my notebook for my task list. So there is no one central place where they can go to look at and say, here's the big picture. Now let me figure out what my plan is going to be. So that's the biggest mistake. And, you know, I blame technology a lot for that because there's so many, oh, I'm going to try this app. I'm going to try that app. So for me, like I have two things. My command center is actually a paper planner now that I'm not at a desk all day. Um, and that is what I, what is telling me what to do and when, and then my backlog of all the things that I know I want to work into my plan eventually, I use Trello for that. Um, I love Trello. So, but that's it. I don't then have an app on my phone. I'm not checking anywhere else. Those are the only places I'm looking. The that second thing is, biggest, huge. Oh, sorry, yeah. I interrupted you. I just wanted to say that's huge because you mentioned before how we wear different hats, right? We, we play different roles in our lives, but we are one person. It's not yeah. like it's a separate your personal life, your work life, your social life, your community life, they're, they're all, you're one person. You can, mm -hmm. you can clone yourself. So why have different planning systems for each of the roles that you play while you're one person, the day has 24 hours, like you need to see those 24 hours in one place. Um, Absolutely. I know my team sometimes, you know, I put my personal stuff also on, I use Outlook because that's what we use at work and it just works that way. Um, and I have my personal stuff in there. Um, I use a different color code. So visually I know similar to your right. point, sometimes is what role is it? Or even within my job, what role within my job I am playing at that time? Or if there is a phone call, I have a color code because if I'm starting the call, I know I need to be there five minutes earlier so I can set things up. Or if I need to move long distances, I use a different color because then I know, okay, it's not like I turn around and I'm in this new place that I need to be, right? I need to plan ahead. So I use a lot of color codes and I have one color code for my personal life, but all my personal life is in the same place that my professional life. Yeah. And I know like one of my corporate jobs, I was not allowed to for security reasons. Like it was such lockdown. So you may be in a situation where, and that worked for me because my work life was completely separate from my purse. I had set hours for both. So in that environment, I did have one calendar for work and then everything personal was separate, but I wasn't, my life wasn't integrated the way it is now. Now I have to make decisions that am I going to work or is it personal? So I have to have the one. Um, the second biggest mistake I see most people make is making decisions on accepting appointments or requests or anything from looking at their phone. 
And when you're looking at your phone, you can see one day and one day only. You can't get the view. So you're maybe you're out, it's a Tuesday, someone texts you, are you available to do something from one to two on Thursday? From your phone, you look at your calendar and you see that that slot is open, so you say yes. Now, if you'd been sitting at your desk or looking at your planner where you saw your whole week, you might have seen that that one hour on Thursday was literally the only one hour you didn't have claimed for the rest of the week. And now you've just said yes, and now that's gone too. And this is what I see leading people to get overscheduled is they are basing their decisions off of a, what, three by five screen size of their life. And we always say yes. And you can see I've got a sign beside me that says every yes is a no. Every time you say yes to something, you're saying no to spending that time doing something else. So I know when people reach out to me and ask, are you available? If I'm not where I can see my, you know, what I call my command center, my response is always, let me check my schedule. I will not say yes until I can look at my week comprehensively, or maybe even my month to make sure I'm not over committing. That is so true. I, I think that we're so used to work out of our phones and operate mm -hmm. out of our phones that um, that is something that you can easily get into that trap. And then, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, can, I can't agree more. Um, to that point, one thing that I personally do is I block time in my calendar for me to work on things. So meeting free time, but I also built in breaks into mm -hmm. my schedule because I think that a lot of times I can accomplish more if I take a small break in between, especially if I'm switching completely gears between topics to reset and set intentions for the next block of time. What are your thoughts on, on doing some of these things or what are some techniques? Yeah, so I actually, you know, as part of, I mentioned, I have that that step-by-step -step weekly planning process. Um, one of the, actually it's the step three in it is blocking off personal time, which is very backwards for most people. Usually they fill up their tasks and then they're like, oh, do I have any leftover for me? So I am always, the first thing that goes on my calendar are existing appointments, things I've already committed to, the second thing that goes on, as I mentioned, like that question mark time for me, which I call unavailable time, time where I, I am engaged in something that means I can't be working on a project or my task list. So like for me, that's always as soon as school is over till the dinner hour. I'm not, we're, I'm not productive, but I am being present and busy elsewhere. So once I have my existing appointments, my unavailable time, then I go in and reserve personal time. Once that's in place, now I'm plugging in my tasks around that. And I, I actually, I think I have a whole podcast on it as well. The difference of a task versus an appointment. If it's a project, that's a priority and it needs focused time. It goes on my calendar as an appointment from nine to 1030 in the morning. I'm working on this thing. It does not get written down as a task for the day. Uh, a task might be get the birthday cards in the mail. Or, you know, something like that. So the, the projects that, that matter, that need my focus time, actually get blocked off in my calendar so that I know I've protected the time to get them done. Oh my God, I can be talking with you for hours, Megan. Like, <laughs> I know, me too. <laughs> this, is, this is amazing. Um, but I want to be very respectful of your time. And I want to give also the opportunity because I'm sure that a lot of listeners, I'm like, oh my God, this is amazing. This is something that I wanna learn more about. How can people connect with you, find you, engage with you and get more information about your, your system? Yeah, so I have, you know, I kind of mentioned that overwhelm, getting out of overwhelm. I've got it documented in a great little cheat sheet that kind of guides you through step-by-step -step what to do. So if anybody wants to go grab that, you can find it at theworklifeharmony.com. You can go grab that cheat sheet. Um, and then I am Megan Sumrall 
everywhere on social media. So it's very easy to find me on Facebook or Instagram. Um, I'm too old to be on TikTok. You won't find me there. Uh, but also I'd love for you to check out my podcast. It's all about time management and organizational tips for women. And it's called Work Life Harmony. Uh, and it's on all the podcast players out there as well. Amazing. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put that link on the description of this podcast episode. So if you're interested to get that that resource, you can click there and not only download that, but check out all the other information about Megan and how to connect with her. Um, Megan, thank you so much You're for so welcome. joining thank me today. You. This has been amazing. I'm, I'm listening to you and I'm like, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> like I'm just nodding my head here because I can relate so much with everything that you said. Um, and I'm so grateful that you accepted the invite to join me today. My Thank pleasure. you very much, Megan. Thank you.